Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I've been asked to talk about the revolving door of people coming into the fold of Islam and people leaving Islam as well. Uh, this is a major problem in our communities as we see the numbers of converts increasing and increasing and increasing and in mashallah, so many people coming to the fold of Islam, seeing the beauty of Islam, but at the same time, at the same time, we have to, have to face the reality that so many people likewise, after coming into the fold of Islam, many times end up leaving Islam, not finding what they thought was there. And the reality is, this, this after this morning, I would like to speak about two reasons why this may happen in our communities and the solution to that, inshallah ta'ala. The first thing is first, that the a major testimony to the validity of the message which the Prophet ﷺ brought was his ability to inspire deep change inside the people he was around in such a short period of time. There's a narration in Sahih Bukhari in which Abu Sufyan, before he accepted Islam, had went to Jerusalem for, a tra for some trade and he's called into the presence of Heraclius, who asked him various questions about this prophet that they had heard about coming. And he had seen different dreams and things like that, which he felt the last prophet was coming. And being a devout Christian, he wanted to know more about this prophet. So he calls Abu Sufyan, who at the time is not Muslim. And he says to him, I'm going to ask you a few questions and I want you to be completely honest about these questions. And these questions are so that I may know better if this man is a true prophet or not. And amongst the questions he asks, he asks, He says, I want to ask you a question. Do any of the people that accept Islam do any of the people around the Prophet Muhammad who accept Islam والسلام, when they enter into the fold of Islam, do any of them leave the religion? And he says, Sukhtan lahu, out of hatred or unsatisfied with the religion. And Abu Sufyan standing there was forced to admit the truth. He said, no, none of them leave the religion. And when asked later, why he asked this question. He said, He said, I asked you this question because the reality is when Iman, true faith, enters into the heart, enters into the chest of a person, it never leaves. It never leaves. So why the, what's the problem? Why do we see this in our communities? What is the cause of it? One of the major reasons, one of the major causes is that when people accept Islam, they read what's in the book. They read what's in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. And then they begin to interact with the believers themselves. And that interaction for the Sahaba brought them closer to the, to the deen because they saw that the messenger was the embodiment of the message. They saw that the one bearing the message enforced or reinforced what the message actually was. But the unfortunate reality that we face in our communities is that when many people accept the message and then walk into the masjid, walk into the Islamic center, they don't see that the bearers of the message are actually reinforcing or in line with the message, which causes major doubts within their hearts. I want to share with you an interesting incident that happened after Fath Mecca or the conquest of Mecca. There was a well-known well, well uh, Sahabi who hadn't accepted Islam yet. His name was Adi bin Hatim. And he was the son of a, a wealthy man, Hatim al-Ta'i, 
who passed away before Islam. And when Islam started to spread, Adi, he didn't want anything to do with it. So he fled as, as far as he could away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to speak about him often. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, where is Adi? I want to talk to Adi. I wish I could just have a conversation with him. So one day, he came on his own accord to meet the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in Medina. Now, I want to narrate this story to you because it is a perfect example of what we're missing and why this door keeps revolving for so many people. He says that I walked into the masjid and right away when I walked in, everyone goes, there's Adi, there's Adi. And they brought me to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he stood up and he grabbed my hand and he held my hand. And he said, I had always hoped and prayed to Allah that one day he would place your hand in my hand. And here they are together. Come with me to my home. So he says, we began to walk. We began to walk to his house as he's holding my hand. And as we're walking, suddenly a, a very short elderly lady from the community stops the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he's walking with me. Now the Prophet Sallallahu is walking with me to give me da'wah, to tell me about Islam. I'm a well-known figure. Everyone in Arabia knows Adi ibn Hatim. Everyone knows my father. My status is kada wa kada. But this old lady, while he's walking with me, this old lady, she stops me. She stops the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And she starts to ask him questions. Son, I want to ask you this. What about this? What about that? What about this? And she asks question after question. She asks statement after statement. Ishkal after ishkal. Over and over she's talking. So Adi ibn Hatim says, فَوَقَفَ tawilan." The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stood there patiently with her for a very long time. And the words that I, I want to share with you, it's beautiful. He said, watching his patience with this woman, asking question after question, watching how he stayed present with her and gave her undivided attention despite the fact that he had something he had to do that was so important. He stopped everything just to talk to her. He listened to the words that Adi ibn Hatim, he says. He says, I recognize at that this, this moment, this man isn't a king. He could only be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, what we have to understand here is the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hasn't even begun to do da'wah yet. He's still on his way going home where he's going to actually talk to him about Islam. But this man, before even reaching the house, has already realized that this man walking with him is a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Think over that for a minute. And what I'm saying is that the, the bearer of the message embodied the message so much that he himself became the message. He himself became the proof to the validity. The problem in our communities, brothers and sisters, is that we are the ones that have created the divergence between ourselves and the actual message, bringing people to doubt the message. Adi ibn Hatim continues the story. He says, finally, we got to the house of the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He got to the house and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had only one pillow, so he offers him the pillow to sit on. And Adi ibn Hatim, he goes, no, you sit on it. And he, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam insists. So here Adi ibn Hatim is sitting elevated on this pillow in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is sitting in front of him on the floor as he talks to him. And Adi says, at that moment I said to myself in my heart, this man is not a king. This man can only be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point, brothers and sisters, he hasn't even begun 
to tell him about the beauty of Islam and what we believe as Muslims and the beauty of worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He hasn't even opened his mouth regarding that. But this man is already convinced. He's already convinced about the truthfulness of the message because of the bearers of the message. So this is the first point I want to touch upon. That as Muslims in the community, our role is to embody the message. Live the message. Be the truth that you talk about. Represent it. Remember that the, the, the medium is the message. Be the truth that you speak about. And on the opposite side of that coin, if you're one of those new Muslims, those, the converts, the reverts, then remember one thing. Keep your eyes focused on the Prophet He is the embodiment of the message. We fall short sometimes, but he fulfilled it to its, as it should be fulfilled. So study his life, learn about him. That will show you the reality of the message that he came to bring as a guidance for us. So brothers and sisters, this is my first point regarding the revolving door, inshallah ta'ala. But there's another more <clears throat> subtle or <clears throat> deeply embedded problem regarding the revolving door. And a missionary, a Christian missionary by the name of Edward Blyden, in the early 19th century, a missionary to West Africa, he wrote a detailed book called Islam, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race. And in this book, he writes about how Christianity spread in, the, uh, in Africa and how Islam spread in Africa and the divergence between those two. And in that book, he talks about the, the failure, the revolving door of Christianity in West Africa. And it's quite interesting because as I read his explanation of the revolving door of Christianity in West Africa, I couldn't help but see myself as I read about his analysis of the revolving door. He says that as Europeans came with Christianity to the west coast of Africa, they came with a mentality and a perspective of racial superiority. The custodians of the salvation, the custodians of the theology of liberation, they, they passed it on from a perspective of uh, uh, racial superiority. And that's the way they gave it. And those accepting the message had to also ac accept a worldview about themselves. They had to accept a worldview about who they were, which was lower than the ones giving them this religion. So what happened, Edward Blyden said, is that there would result from that a self-hatred. Everything that's African would be hated. Everything from my culture would be hated. Everything about me would be hated. Everything about who I was, I had to leave at the door to accept Christianity. This is what Edward Blyden said was the problem and would be the, res the reason why people would leave Christianity in such large numbers. This is quite interesting. Because for many Muslims, reverts, we have also been fed Islam or taught Islam from a perspective of racial inferiority. That everything I have, everything that I came with, everything that what I was is nothing, it's gone. And now I have to become a whole new person. I have to leave behind everything that I was. The fact of the matter is, brothers and sisters, the Rasul Sallallahu he said, "Anasu kal ma'adin, kama'adin al-dhahab wal-fidda, khiyaruhum fil jahiliya, khiyaruhum fil Islam idha faqahu." The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi he said that everyone has within them, every culture of people, has within them beautiful qualities. And the best of people in the days of ignorance will be the best of people when they take those qualities from the days of ignorance and bring them into Islam. Those will be the best of people when they learn the religion, when they learn their responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Edward Blyden's point is, is, is amazing. 
Because what he's saying is that he says Islam was different. He says that Islam was different because when people came with Islam to Africa, he says they never did it from a perspective that we are better than you, but rather that you have within yourself the means to become the best of creation. And we just want to give you something to aid to that. You are already amazing people. You need not hate who you are. You need not get rid of your name and everything about you. You need not change the things you eat or change the way you dress. But rather embrace the true reality of who you are and let Islam bring the beauty of that out. This is what Edward Blyden said in the early 19th century, uh, uh, 20th century regarding how Islam was to be successful in West Africa versus what he felt would be the revolving door of Christianity in West Africa. That as people started to look at themselves and say, why am I hating myself? And changing their worldview, they would also change the religion that gave them that worldview as well. This is very powerful, brothers and sisters. Because of the implications it has, Many converts walk into the masjid and the first thing that you throw on them is a shalwar kameez, right? The first thing you throw on is some type of exotic, different type of clothing. The next thing you do is feed them the type of food that too spicy or whatever it may be. The point is that they're, they're given this religion in a way that I'm inferior to you. And that's not the way that our Prophet Sallallahu and the Sahaba spread Islam to other people. And he said, mo most prolific of what he said was that the way that Islam spread was what he called discipleship versus, versus imitation. He says for, the, for the, Afri the West African, it was about imitating the Christian who gave them the religion. We just want to be like you. We just want to be like you. You are the goal of everything. But he said for Islam that spread in West, West Africa, it was quite different. When Islam spread in West Africa, it was a, a style of discipleship, which is we are here to make you masters of yourself, not to become masters of you. Not for you to look up to us, but for humanity to look up to you. Brothers and sisters, the revolving door is serious. We have to do our part. And our part is number one, embodying the message, be the message that you preach. And number two, give Islam to people in a way that doesn't make them hate themselves, doesn't make them erase their identity, doesn't make them change who they are, but actually just brings out the beauty of who they are. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to make this weekend of benefit for all of us. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us firm iman, to make our iman firm, our faith firm, and to make us or give us unity with the message that we are sharing with humanity. Jazakallah khair, inshaAllah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.